Hi, everyone. Welcome. This is a City Arts and Lectures webcast in place of what would have been a live event at the Sydney Goldstein Theater on April 20th, 2020. Um, but actually, weirdly enough, I'm excited that this is a Zoom call. I think it will work better because this is going to be a discussion about clothing and fashion. And through this webcast, we can really look at clothes up close in a way that we couldn't live on stage. Um, so I'm really excited to be here. My name is Avery Truffleman. I host a podcast about design and fashion called Articles of Interest. And I feel so lucky to get to talk to Janelle Abbott and Camilla Carper, two designers and artists who met at stu as students, two designers and artists who met as students at Parsons and continued to collaborate long after they moved to separate cities. Janelle is based in Seattle and Camilla is based in LA. And together under the clothing brand and performance practice called Female, spelled M-A-I-L, they send garments back and forth to each other in the mail, each designer adding and editing until every individual garment is this kind of exquisite corpse of memory and improvisation. Um, so thanks for, for being here, you two. <laughs> thank um, you. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to start with a kind of, <laughs> <laughs> I just kind of wanted to start with a general overarching question because I've read in various interviews uh, that you've done where you've referred to this idea of having a dressing practice. Um, and I just wanted to start by asking you what that means because arguably, don't we all have one? It's something we're legally required to do, wear <laughs> clothes. And it's almost kind of like the foodie movement. Like, yes, we all have to do this thing. What is it? What constitutes a dressing practice? Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a, I, I don't know. If, I think that's a really intelligent way of framing what we do. Um, maybe I feel like I, I've maybe spoken to it in that, in that extent before. Um, but it's true. We all do have to wear clothes to exist in the world and everyone does have a dressing practice. I think both Janelle and I are kind of consciously looking to clothes to tell us about our needs and, um, the different ways we interact with the world and kind of using it as a way to process our internal dialogues. I think it also extends beyond just the action of putting clothing onto your body, but what are the different methodologies that you utilize to bring clothing into your world? And so Camilla and I both have had a habit of finding clothing on the street or picking up clothing from friends or going thrifting and really digging in, literally digging in at the bins, like the Goodwill outlet where you have to buy, you buy things by the pound there. So I think for myself and I would say for Camilla as well, it's, it's about that, the totality of the action, the gathering, the clothes, the assembling a wardrobe from um, those clothes and then day to day, how can you interweave all those different pieces in new and different ways? And then looking at over time, like what pieces stay with you and why, or maybe what pieces stay with you and why can't you get rid of them? even if you're not wearing them anymore. And that's been a lot of what female has dealt with. Yeah, and um, I guess I wanna, I wanna get into um, how female deals with this kind of assembly that you're talking about, this gathering and mixing of these pieces that we all, which is like a practice we all engage in, quote unquote. Um, so I guess, what is, what is female? <laughs> <laughs> um, can I tell yeah. the beginning? Okay. The beginning. So the very beginning of female, this is my favorite part of the story. I would come home from college every summer and I worked at the Woodland Park Zoo, but not in a fun way. I was in food services. And one summer I got stuck in the cotton candy cove and I wasn't making the cotton candy at the time. I was just working the register, but the guy who was making the cotton candy, he would create these um, like sculptures out of the cotton candy. And I'm like, this guy, you know, we could be friends. Um, um, but then one day we needed to call our boss. And so he hands me his phone and um, I, I was looking up, trying to find her phone number on there and he didn't know her name. So he just put her in as female boss. 
But he didn't even spell female correctly. He spelled it F-E-M-A-I-L. And I'm like, me and this guy can't be friends anymore. <laughs> this is so disrespectful. But also, what a clever way to spell female. So I went back to school. This must have been 2011. I went back for senior year. And I'm like, I got to start this collective of females who make art together and we'll call ourselves f-e-m-a-i-l so there was actually six people originally and we um i i was trying to coordinate everyone together to kind of like exquisite corpse as you would art amongst one another and we had a couple art parties but senior year got crazy and a lot of people jumped ship and then when we graduated i wanted to keep it going and camilla out of that group was the only one who was interested in continuing to pursue this idea so i moved back to seattle and they at the time moved to sacramento initially yeah yeah, yeah before san francisco yeah. and so um i made this series of jumpsuits that were just like big pants and big tops sewn together and I sent them all to Camilla and I was like, do whatever you want. And then they came back and I didn't expect any of the manipulations that Camilla had contributed and it just started to roll from there. It took us two years to produce our first collection. It was only eight jumpsuits. Um, yeah. I, I, Camilla, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Um, I to yeah, back. I mean, I think, like, for me, I was more interested in having a pen pal relationship with Janelle. <laughs> and the name female just, like, served it really well. Way better than it did previously with, because we were actually forced to make things through the mail. And um, we started to kind of find uh, more of a philosophy to how we were making things within our first presentation. And um, we decided that we we're gonna be exploring how clothing could be a vehicle to hold a conversation and um, a new way to communicate with one another. And I feel like our practice with clothes almost works better for us than through writing letters because it's a, a totally new way of exchanging information yeah i mean there's that's, yeah sorry <laughs> no go um, ahead there's just one distinct time where i got a garment back from camilla and it had elements of this yellow plaid jacket that they had worn for a really long time and it was very uh share and clueless style and I was like, what is happening in your life that you could cut this piece up? Because it is so precious. And um, there's just been other moments like that where I felt this mode of communication helped us to reveal things through the action of making that maybe we weren't able to say verbally. It it really, yeah, it was, it's provided like a very special intimate mode of communication. Well, let's break it down. Can you walk me through, you're both wearing garments that you designed. <laughs> Can you walk me through the process of how you went about uh, collaboratively making one of them? Sure. Um, I think we should start with talking about your garment because it was made first, Janelle. Yeah, um, it's not the one I'm wearing, actually. Oh. So I, I know, oh. this is just my favorite piece. Um, <laughs> I mean, we could talk about this one. Um, this is from our 2.0 collection, which is called Sponge Mob Happy Place. And I actually have a SpongeBob water bottle with me right now. <laughs> <laughs> this, it's a... Um, it's, uh, that yellow like, fabric right there. It's neon. Um, <laughs> it's a, yeah, it, it was a neon sweater that like a construction sweater, it's got the iridescent stripes on it. And I'm pretty sure I found it on the side of the road or somehow it came into my life and it had the construction company information on it. And so I sewed a, 
frowny face patch on the front and a happy face patch on the back and I wore it to jog for a while but then it just got really smelly and ratty and so I cut it up and started this piece and sent it off to Camilla and I don't know if you can speak to this material Camilla it's a uh, I got that at um in it's Oakland like this black and white kind of Keith Herring looking yeah, yeah it's kind of a geometric it's actually navy with white it it reminds me it's like a geometric animal print almost. Yeah. Yeah, it looks almost like cheetah print, but a little bit more hand done. Um, and I got it at uh, Creative Reuse or Scrap, I oh. think, in uh, Oakland. Creative Reuse, hell yeah. 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 They're Which, the best. Yeah, Janelle goes to in Seattle as well. Yeah, yeah, they just opened one up a couple years ago, and it's been really <laughs> Really great addition to the city. Um, so the garment started as this kind of flap. The back of it just flaps on. This is gonna get. Oh yeah, you can kind part. of see the like work workman vest element yeah, in yeah, the back there. Yeah. The stripes. So it started as that flap, and then Camilla put the ruffle around the flap, and then the skirt developed out of another. It's a lime green sort of again construction worker t-shirt that I painted um, white checkers on because I had made this tapestry almost. I found a black and white checker flag that a pizza delivery guy would have put, you know, on the, on his on car. On the hood of their car, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like that. <laughs> and then there's um, a little piece of black fabric with white daisies. Um, with yellow centers down here too. And so that was all a tapestry that got incorporated into this. And then Camilla, you painted on this, this fabric came from you. It's it's like a lining. It's kind of a t turquoise blue lining fabric. And you painted hands on it. I, I don't know why. Oh, I don't know. I was just really obsessed with hands at the time. Yeah. And like, we have a lot of posters too. Like our show posters are covered in like these cl like scary claws with long nails. Oh, fancy hands. Fancy hands. hands. Yeah, we yeah, love fancy like creepy hands. creepy femme hands. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fancy hands. Tell me about what it means to be zero waste. I mean, do you ever, are you ever like, oh, this garment would look great with a pop of pink, but oh well, I don't have any now, so I can't buy any like what does mm. zero waste look like in practice when you make clothes I mean it's true you can't have full control over what you make but it causes you to be more in a state of listening um what do I have how do they come together versus like my idea is to have an all pink wardrobe and it will you know it's it's more connected to your everyday life. Um, yeah. Yeah. And we also utilize the zero waste concept in pattern drafting. We've done a couple um, more quote unquote traditional attempts at fashion design where we actually design patterns and then produce multiple pieces. And so in that case, to be zero waste, the pattern piece is a perfect rectangular square. So if you were to take one of those garments and deconstruct them, you could reassemble the garment into that perfect rectangular square. There's no scraps produced in the process of creating the garment. Whereas traditional clothing manufacturing can waste up to 15% of the material because every positive shape, you've got the neckline over here has this negative shape. And if you're not being really cognizant of how you're laying out your individual pattern pieces together, you can end up with these little bits of, of waste. So even in deconstructing the clothing that we use for female, we always save the scraps. A whole garment might not end up in one female garment, but you'll see the rest of it elsewhere at a later date. And I don't know if you can see in my studio, I've got a bunch of, um, big Tupperware containers in the back. That's all fabric. That's all scrap. Oh, yeah, scraps God. of material from from the past seven years that we've been working together. I just cleaned out, uh, I ended up with these um, Camilla's I Heart NY um, pajama bottoms. 
<laughs> and this is a little scrap that's left from them. So I just pinned it on my wall because at some point it'll end up somewhere. But it's pretty precious. Yeah, I really get a that... kick out of how material sprinkles through our work. And you'll see, yeah, you'll see like this uh, Pokemon sheet. I've been like femaling for like, yeah, almost a decade now and all the little bits have like gone through every collection i think between myself and camilla as we're exchanging things there's always just these really delightful mis uh misconceptions like a piece will show up for me and i'll think the back is the front and then somewhere <laughs> down the line camilla will be like no it's the other way around or I'll send a piece to Camilla and I thought it was a dress, but then it'll come back and it'll be pants. And I'm like, I, okay. Yeah. <laughs> like, we've gotten, this... we've gotten into arguments, like in, when things are about to like be shown, like how they should be worn. Like, is it the front or the back? Is it a dress? Is it pants? And like, it becomes up to the person wearing it. gets to decide how it should be. So. So for people who can't see these, like, they are just as, I don't want to say, like, wild, but they're as unconventional as people might be imagining. Like, you can't buy these clothes at Everlane. And I guess <laughs> it just gives, it brings me to the question of um, wearability, if that makes any sense. I mean, these are art objects and they're clothes, and you can't necessarily, you know, they have all of these components and paint and you can't necessarily wear them while you know biking mm -hmm. and um you know and I think they also require a degree of confidence to pull off in your everyday life so I don't know what does wearability mean to you in this practice as you're selling these clothes oh gosh <laughs> I don't think we think about wearability at all like we really, really design like a way to get into the clothes half the time <laughs> yeah <laughs> I yeah I definitely feel like we've come to some points where at least for myself it's like we just we're sitting on too much stock and we need to be more business savvy about how we make things so that people actually want to buy them but then at the same time I feel like we're both living out our 12 year old fantasies of just doing whatever we want, whenever we want, and like making the craziest things possible. And so couching it as an art object and providing the consumer with an understanding about what's in it, why it's expensive, and um, what it means to really own the thing. I don't think clothing has to be all about wearability. Like, I think it's okay to a certain degree to own a garment just because you love the way it looks. Like there is a fine line of saying, I wanna keep this garment because I love the way it looks, but someone else probably could be wearing it. And so in a sense, you're like stealing that opportunity from someone else to wear that thing. But with female, like if you love it and you wanna own it, but you're never gonna wear it, I think that's totally fine. Like hang it on your wall, put it in your closet and then cash in someday when it's worth something, maybe, when we're dead. Like, <laughs> and you're somehow still alive. I hope that happens. <laughs> we have had, like, attempts of making wearable clothes. Like, we tried to do a ready-to-wear collection a couple times. And I don't know. It's just not, it's, we're not the gap. And, like, that's okay. Like, there, you can buy, buy leggings to work out in, like, not a female garment, although we do make models work out in our clothes and a lot of our presentation, <laughs> which is mean. But. Like 90 degree heat. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think there's a lot of people out there who are making really wild and wearable clothing, but we're, we're coming to terms with the fact that that's not us and that's okay. Right? Like, they need to exist and we need to exist because it rounds out the world of fashion. Like it's so plural. 
Totally, totally. And honestly, you know, when I first encountered your garments, I thought they were strictly art objects. I thought they were just <laughs> like conceptual and you hang them on the wall. And then actually a friend of mine was visiting from Philly and was wearing one of your shirts just Whoa. out, like to go to the grocery store. And I was like, Whoa. you can just do that? <laughs> <laughs> Janelle, you were talking about your pricing model. Can I ask about your like complicated algorithm for pricing that I could not get my head around? Yeah. Um, Camilla and I developed this formula to price our pieces with our very first collection because we sat down just before presenting it and we looked at each other completely blank, like, how do we price this? What is it worth? We had no system. So we created an extremely complicated system for two people who aren't great at math. Really bad. Not, not the strong <laughs> suit, but it's math intensive. So we have essentially five categories. Um, it starts with T, which stands for time spent as represented by layers. So that means how many times have each of us worked on the piece? So this particular piece, it's actually this one that features all of Camilla's high school bras attached to it. That's incredible. Um, this That's piece. so crazy. <laughs> uh, yeah, it also has a scrap. We had, we did have a quote unquote failed garment from our first collection that never made it out into the world, but we disassembled it into chunks and then those chunks got sewed onto all kinds of different things. There's a chunk back here that's like a roughly cheetah piece that's been spray painted and then some yarn fringe and a little bit of mesh that's also been painted. Um, so this particular piece, it's been seen on four different occasions. So that's an extra hundred dollars just because it's relatively famous in the world of female. And then finally, if we found a garment extremely frustrating, we actually make it more expensive. So usually the uglier the garment, the more we had, like we had to work on it more, we really labored. It's just, it's a horrible thing. We hate it. We're gonna charge the most for it. Oh my God, I so that love we get that. Stuck it's true, with like it. aesthetics, yeah. No one will ever want it. No one want. <laughs> we don't want it, you don't want it. <laughs> No one can afford it. We can't sell it. So it sits with us for a long time. So that's what F is at the very end of this equation. Um, it will be, it actually says plus or minus, but we almost always choose to add an additional 10 or 15% of the total at that point to the garment if it was particularly frustrating. So at the very end of all of that math, you end up with the total of the piece which this one that I was just holding up because it has such significant sentimental value with Camilla's old bras and this there in the middle of it, there's a crocheted patch that my friend Mara sent to me. Um, this particular piece is a thousand dollar, uh, $1,071. Woof. Which <laughs> but it's an art piece. Yeah. Pretty reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> but wait, so I want, speaking of, um, money. <laughs> you are having a huge sale right now and going through the process of spring cleaning, which I guess is like as close to conmarrying your closet as <laughs> either of you will ever get. And so I guess I just want to ask, um, well, first of all, say, hooray, the sale is great. It's very cool to be able to afford female clothes. Um, and I'm excited that they're going to be out in the world and owned by more people. But um, I guess this leads to the larger question of like, what are we supposed to do with all the clothing we amass? Um, I mean, we've thought of a method, which is cut it up and remake it into other stuff. Um, but I think for me, I. I try to just take less clothing in, in general. That's my hack at it. But yeah, it's hard. Yeah, I, I think it's about um, looking at the individual pieces, not for what they are in the moment, but what they could be. And ultimately, clothing is, is just, it's fabric, it's textiles, and you can manipulate that into becoming literally anything. So. We've used it to make other clothing, but we've also used it to make tapestry. We've made furniture out of old clothes. We've explored a lot of different avenues of how these 
pretty simple textiles. If you just take out the seams, they're flat pieces again, they can be reconfigured into anything. And I feel like that segues really nicely into your project, Janelle, uh, wardrobe therapy. Can you tell me about that? Yeah. So it, it did kind of come out of female where we had a moment where people were dumping off a lot of clothing on us. And it was a bit overwhelming just because we were increasingly getting a lot of material. And some people wanted to tell us what was meaningful about the pieces that were they were giving to us. And so I dreamed up this service where... I would go to people's houses, have a conversation with them about their clothing like, um, and their history with fashion. Like, um, I have this whole questionnaire that I go through. This is one that's been filled out through the process. <laughs> um, so I ask things like, what's your earliest memory regarding clothing? Like, what are your different phases through childhood and high school? Like, what influenced those phases? Um, we talk about their shopping habits and, um, you know, what needs to change in the fashion industry and, and then also how they want clothing to associate to their body. Like where should it fit really tight? Where should it be loose? What length should it be? Um, you know, what necklines and arms, uh, sleeve styles do they prefer? So I just try to gather as much information as possible. And then some people need assistance actually going through their closet and purging. Um, other people though, I show up and they've got a pile of clothing waiting for me and they're like these are all the pieces that I love but I don't wear but I can't get rid of so then we have another conversation like what are these items what do they mean to you um, and so by the end of all that we boil it down to about five garments and then I go through the process of um, with the information I've gathered from them I sketch out just some rough ideas about what we could transform their clothing into um, and then I take it back to my studio and I cut their clothes apart. I reconfigure them together. I do a fitting with the client. And then at the end, we do a photo shoot um, so that now these garments that were really um, important to them and meaningful and like imbued with memories, they can live with them in new and different forms. Um, so it's a service for clients, but it's also been kind of a fun exploration for me because previous to this project, I had only ever made clothing with myself in mind or with female, which is like, we're not thinking about anybody. There's just like stuff's happening. So this is the first time, <laughs> yeah. it was the first time where I actually had to connect with a client and be like, what do you need? What do you want? What can I make for you? And so my aesthetic doesn't really matter. It does inform some projects, but I ultimately am really trying to make something that this person will want to wear. Um, so it's almost, it's almost been two years now and, um, every client is different. And so every project turns out different. And sometimes I'm making clothing that I would never wear or I would never make otherwise, but I'm happy to do it because people, need this kind of service and more and more I'm finding it people are signing up they want to participate but it's just me in the background with the sewing machine so I, I can't do as much as I would like no it's so gratifying to see the before and after images of wardrobe therapy like you can recognize these clothes presumably purchased at like a forever 21 and then you see them transform into these like cowboy jumpsuit just like amazing things that you fall in love with and it's um it's it's kind of like you know we're all used to the it's such an established genre the makeover show like we you know <laughs> queer eye is so popular every yeah. teen movie has like a makeover montage scene um and to see that happen like within someone's closet is this really kind of cool superpower that you have <laughs> But it's interesting also, like, both of your answers to the question of, like, what do we do with the clothes we amass manifest itself in your individual projects. And mm -hmm. so, Camilla, your answer was, like, I try to bring in less, <laughs> which brings us to your project of the, I, I don't know what to call it, 20-yard roll of linen for a year. Can yeah. Yeah. Um, it kind of has a name that always changes <laughs> depending on who I'm talking <laughs> to, but... Um, Basically, in 2018, I was going through a lot of stuff and I kind of just needed to start over. And um, I wanted to find 
a similar way of approaching garments that female does where um, kind of looking to the objects to tell me something about my life and committing to the fact that they're kind of like living, breathing things and that they're always going to be changing because a person's style is always changing. Um, and I'd rather right. we regenerate completely every 14 years. Like, we yeah. Have to yeah. And like, <laughs> I wanted to find a way where my clothes could grow with me as I change and tell me how, how I'm thinking and changing. So, um, I started to start, like I kind of formed an experiment. So I started with a blank slate and I chose linen and I just got 20 yards of dead stock linen and I picked 20 yards because that's how much was on a roll, the minimum they would sell me. And um, I started off the year completely naked and decided that I would only make clothes as I needed them in reaction to my life and how I felt. And eventually through the year, I ran out of material and had to start remaking the objects that I had made previously. So like bikini tops became winter coats and then became summer dresses again. And I got to see what I was feeling and needed at the time. So you made all of your clothes entirely for one whole year out of this whole, uh, out of this one bolt of linen. Yes. And like, it was white, right? So you could like see. It was natural colored. Um, So it wasn't dyed. Uh, okay. treated. Um, yeah. And it got really stained up. Um, at the end of the year, I disassembled all of the garments in on a New Year's Eve performance and uh, puzzled them back together into the original shape that the fabric came in. So 20 yards by five feet. And um, I'm still sewing it together right now. And I probably will be for the rest of my life. So why is it so hard? There's so many behind me is my like work board, how I puzzle things back together again to sewing. Um, but there's like these little pieces. So like I made shoes and by like ripping up, linen. by making rope and coiling it. And like, so there's these little tiny pieces and it's, it's 50 feet long. So I'm like sewing little microscopic pieces together and it it ends up looking really beautiful um, because it's I have to do it by hand because they're so small, but holding up, you can see like, this is like the neckline of a garment in. Sure. Or yeah, so yeah, all the little pieces just take forever to sew, so. I mean, was it weird? How do I say this? You know, like, it seems like you believe, you know, clothing is a really powerful form of self-expression and you can pull off these amazing garments that you make that I don't think a lot of people would be like willing to try to pull off. And was it strange to just wear this one kind of neutral color for a whole year to dress that simply? Um, I think what the weirdest thing that came out from it was not personally not having color in my life, but I became this character in the world because I was interacting with people and I'd always be wearing the same color. And so I became like, um, like, a felt kind of like a Disneyland character in my life. And it kind of framed every situation of me being very aware of my body and space and how people were were considering me, which was super interesting. But that was the strangest thing for me about wearing the same color all year was the people in my life. Just like your neighbors and random people being like, yeah. hey, you're the one who wears linen all the time. Yeah, <laughs> no way. yeah. just, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Which felt is like another crazy, <laughs> oh, that's so, in- it's like another crazy superpower of clothing that we forget that we can do. Like anyone has that power to turn themselves into a character. Yeah, mm. completely. And I think 
I needed to know that the symbols I was putting on my body, I fully understood what they meant and like could take ownership over them completely because previous to that, I think I always kind of just, you know, uh, slap whatever is funny on, like whatever makes me laugh, I'll put it on. And like, I mean, just like whatever t-shirt you found at the Goodwill or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And whatever looks like silly. And I was just always like setting out to look funny, but it almost seemed like a defense mechanism in a way of not taking ownership over what I was wearing for me personally. Um, Cause it wasn't that I liked it. It was that it was a good joke, you know? <laughs> no, totally. I, well, it's interesting. It kind of brings into this, into mind this question of, I mean, I think about this all the time, how much control we have over what we wear. I mean, we have more control over what we wear than, say, the buildings we live in or work in or the way our streets are designed. But, you know, that gets into the larger, like, we think we have control over what we wear, but to what degree are we just taking what we buy at the store? To what degree is that store just taking what's in trend? You know, like, to to what to, and so it's just, it's just interesting that you've had this... I mean, you both have had these moments of actual true autonomy of just relaying exactly the image you want to relay into the world, which is the power of making your own clothes. Um, And I guess almost as a 180 turn from wearing the same color linen all year long, uh, Janelle, can I ask you about uh, Ugly House on the Prairie and what that project is? Yeah. That one actually started, there's a curtain factory here in Seattle that had gone out of business and an art collective took over their space just as a temporary gallery. And the basement is full of dead stock curtain fabric. So I got to go in there and pull a bunch of bolts and so many elements of the past are constantly reverberating and I see it in my city today. So I was feeling somewhat guilty about existing uh, like on this land and and in, in, in the way that I do with so much privilege in how I get to live my life. Um, so the collection kind of became a reflection of like taking on all this refuse, like all this abandoned material, literally abandoned material, but all this refuse of the past and like the, the world that we have to live in now, which is built upon these, this, there's just like layers of garbage basically. Um, so yeah, the, the collection, Aesthetically is inspired by the mid to late 1800s. I got to go to the Goodwill downtown Seattle. They have a vintage archive and they just let me in there for however long I wanted. And so I was pawing over these garments from the 1840s and gathered a lot of visual inspiration from that. But like the emotional content of it is just the ugly reality of the world that we live in. Um, and, And so the garments, I tried to make them ugly, but in doing so, they ended up very cute, and that's how it works. Um, They're like frilly, and they've got collars. And, yeah, yeah, everything's. It's just like ruffles everywhere. It's orange. It's turquoise. It's pale pinks. It's a um, mix of patterns. It's a mix. You know, there's like uh, crushed velvet, but then there's waxed cotton, and and then just all this dead stock curtain fabric, which arrives in a lot of different textures. So. Yeah, and it's it's got this horse motif, which is kind of about that that illusion of freedom. Like, you know, what horse is truly free? Like, they live in a cage. They're subject to their owners, and and I feel that way about about this life. Like, am I truly free in that I'm I'm chained to the the history of this nation, and I don't I don't know how to deal with it, and I don't know how to escape it. Like. No, I think about this. Yeah, all the time, (laughs) especially with the history of clothing itself. And you think about, you know, why we have this rich textile history. I mean, it goes back to slavery. It all goes back to the cotton trade. You think about the rise of industry and Lowell and weaving, like the fact that one of the earliest factories was was a textile factory. Um, And that there's, you know, even just the structural inequality built into our clothes that like men have bigger pockets than women. Mm -hmm. Um, Men have pockets. (laughs) Men have have pockets. pockets. Yeah. 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 Levi Strauss bought his patent for the uh, cotton twill that we know as denim today um, from a slave trader in the East 
denim was developed for slaves to wear while picking cotton in the fields. And that is the most prominent material that's worn in the world today. Like, how do you reconcile with that? Like, yeah, no, just it's so crazy to think that like dealing with fashion, dealing with clothing, dealing with textiles, this whole I mean, it's so hard not to speak in clothing metaphors once you start talking about clothing. <laughs> I was about to be like, this whole swath of industry is like yeah. interwoven, <laughs> with whatever. But I mean, um, it's so easily relegated as something frivolous or something silly or something that's only for um, women, queers, youth, people of color, like, quote unquote, not important. And the, it just has everything you're talking about, all the burdens of history are weirdly baked into it and to ignore clothing and to ignore fashion, this thing we all have to do is to ignore that history. There's a, a lot that can be learned from dressing and interacting that I think is like a super underexplored area of so much information can be learned from that. Yeah. And I think Janelle's exploring it. You're exploring it, Avery. I hope I am. <laughs> Super exciting. Um, yeah. No, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. That's such a good note to um, to end our part of the conversation on. Um, and there's some audience questions that are really great, actually. Oh. Um, I'm trying to see. Uh, do you have any tips for dressing sustainably if you don't have the skills to sew or make clothes? Oh, yeah. What you got? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my most obvious suggestion is to thrift, right? Like, yeah. that's a good place to start. Like, abstain from supporting fast fashion for the rest of the year. Just start there. Like, don't buy things from H&M. Don't buy things from Target. Even if it's convenient and you need it, put that aside. Go to a thrift store and see if you can find something better. You probably can. You certainly can. Like, that's definitely the the gateway we walked through to enter this world of sustainable fashion. And I, I think it's one that's extremely accessible to almost everyone. And there's so many online thrift resources now, too. Like, follow people on Instagram. Do, what is it, thread up? I don't even know. I'm like, I'm not. <laughs> I can't suggest those things, but go to your local thrift store and look around. No, I found it was a great way to tame the sort of, because I used to just go on internet shopping websites and just scroll, like scroll, scroll, scroll in the same way that I used to look at magazines when I was a kid. And just now I go, when I feel that itch, which I now know is fashion working its way, when I look in my closet and I'm like, oh, there's nothing to wear and I can feel that that's a fashion cycle churning and everything looks outdated. Instead, I can just go to the real real or yeah, or thread up and just scroll around there and it totally scratches that itch instead of going to a fancy new clothing website. Or if there's something that I want, I'll just look up those keywords in eBay or Etsy and mm -hmm. you can find, I mean, there's nothing new under, under the sun and you can find almost the identical thing used usually. Yeah. Yeah, uh -huh. or like look in your closet and just consider what what are you not wearing and why? And what do you have that you can pair with those things so that you will wear them again? Or what are new ways that you can wear your clothing? Like when I was in high school, I would wear skirts as uh, tube dresses like all the time. So if you have a dress that you can just pull up or a skirt that you can pull up and make a dress like where does that take you with your wardrobe? Like, how can you then explore combining other items with it? I, I think a lot of people just need to let go of the idea that they need to look presentable and show up in the world looking more authentic. And it's like, I authentically have nothing to wear, so I just wore everything that I own <laughs> at the same time, right? And people are going to think you look fabulous because it's, it's fearless. And, like, that's – confidence is what – I think people are mostly drawn to when it comes to clothing. And if you can wear really stupid, ugly stuff confidently, then then you're on a good path. <laughs> yeah, my tip for the wearing stuff differently, 
a button down shirt can be worn as a skirt. It can be worn as a dress. You can button two button downs together. Yes. With no sewing at all. Tying is really button, incredible. Button three button downs together and wrap it. Yeah. So sharp. Once I was traveling in my truck, like driving around all summer with like a bunch, like a pre box to give away stuff. And I randomly got invited to lecture at Berkeley and I had nothing to wear. And I just pulled a bunch of button downs up and buttoned them together in weird ways. And I looked so professional because what's more professional than a button down, you know? That's amazing. I'm going to go try that. That's so incredible. And I guess this leads to the, another great question, um, which is, how are you keeping clothing exciting while staying inside? And I feel like that leads to larger questions about like who we dress for and, mm. you know, when, when, when there are no eyes on the street. Well, I mean, it gives, it's a great opportunity to wear things that aren't functional, I think. Um, no quarantine is better than in a female garment where you don't actually have to get on the subway or ride your bike. Put on your heels, wear weird makeup. Like you can look like the biggest freak in these times and not, and really just explore and not have to worry about judgment. Not that you should, but you know. It's a Easier good, said than done. Yeah, yeah, it's a good place to practice and just play, I think. Um, Janelle, did you have, <laughs> sorry. Uh, yeah, I mean, I feel like I'm in a weird position with the quarantine situation in that I, I always work alone, so I can keep working. Like I'm not actually stuck at home. I'm at my studio right now. And so when I'm here, I'm in my work clothes and I'm making things that I'm excited about, but the things I'm wearing are purely functional. So I feel like I can't really answer that question very well. Fair enough. S sadly, <laughs> I wish I was dressing up more, but I'm 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 just working on making clothes for other people to dress up, and that excites me. I would rather other people be like having a crazy fun time in what they're wearing, um, and I'll I'll just I'll just keep wearing what's working for me because I need to ride my bike here and then paint a thing and sit on the floor and get covered in thread. It's it's business now, which is kind of sad because dressing was a really fun thing for me for a very long time. But I've just come into this place with my lifestyle where dressing is very functional. And like the evidence of my work lands on my clothing. Um, but my clothing. You mean literally is, like paint. Yeah, like paint and bike grease. And I, I like cut my clothes on accident and you know, they get ripped and torn up and I just keep wearing them until they fall apart, um, which I am enjoying that. But I like Camilla's world of fantasy and fun. I, I Yeah, it's a, that's a good world to be in. Wait, Camilla, you were telling me earlier about your trend prediction about what will what will happen post pandemic. Can you tell me a little bit about that or your um, trend fantasy? Well, post pandemic and current, just that like maybe people when they go into social situations they'll be like the grocery store which is all we've got that you'll be dressing like really intensely to go to the grocery store um and just putting on your best attire to be in public sounds like a ball gown in public sounds great to me and nothing looks better with face masks than a ball gown i think it's really true. Yeah. It's really true. Yeah. Um, another question is, where do you go for style inspiration? Uh, I feel like I'm kind of anti-inspiration personally. I like mm. it to just find find me. Um, and like, that's my own take on it. Like, with female, I let it just whatever... Janelle has discarded becomes the base for to build something off of. So like if it's a bikini top sewn on a sweater, like that's where we can start going. Is it like, what is that about? And what can we build off of it? Is it more beach stuff? Is it more knitwear on it? 
is it this like post-apocalyptic summer snowscape like what's happening like it just kind of blooms out of the material I guess yeah, yeah I I think that's really the key, especially when designing sustainably or zero waste. It's always about what do you have ready, readily available? How does it communicate together, that material? And then for me, I, I add on layers of, of contemplation and like emotional content. And a lot of the time it's, it's just like my existential dread that gets layered onto the material. And that can be kind of surface value, but it really is about the material and how it speaks to you and how it combines and the path it naturally takes. I feel like we both aren't trying to manipulate the material to achieve something that we envision. It's just kind of like, oh, it's happening. I'm going with it. And and things There's come from that. Bit of that, kismet. Yeah. Yeah. It's like we could have never planned, sketched, imagined the things that we make. And that I mean, that was really my problem in design school. I would draw pictures and I was always drawing the same picture. I'm like, I can't draw any other picture. I can't design anything else. But for me, what I found is like designing comes from action. Like designing happens in the making. It's about creating a problem for yourself and then solving it. And for, for female, I feel like it's a problem Camilla created, didn't want to fix and sent to me. And I'm like, gotta fix it <laughs> and vice versa it's like i made a mistake your turn <laughs> now you get to solve this problem so yeah and and an excessive amount of material like that's a problem in the world we're we're drowning in product how do you solve that problem that's another question someone asked i said um if we produce so much clothing that can't possibly be consumed how can we justify the term sustainable fashion clothing I, I like to think of us as building the future of fashion, like on the trash heap of fashion past, like we're here trying in our own way to solve the problem of fast fashion. And, and I think it's evident in our lives. Like we don't, or at least myself personally, I don't buy newly manufactured clothing. And if I do, it's from a maker who I know or who I'm familiar with their practice and can feel comfortable then. Um, so I think it is kind of a holistic approach to sustainability. It's like, I'm living this life in a very specific way and providing the world with pieces so that they can live in a similar fashion. Although yeah. if you don't have access to a, you know, a bevy of contemporary up and coming designers who you know and love, do you have any resources? Where, like, where can people go to find those designers? I mean, Instagram, honestly. <laughs> Cafe I've Forgot. Served, yeah, Cafe Forgot's great. What's um, that? You can go for it, Janelle. I've never actually been there. Oh. Unfortunately, yeah. Every time I show up in New York, they're not happening. But it's two friends who started this new mode of of shopping um, through like a very like community. It's like a very community fo focused approach to clothing consumption. You've been there. Yeah. I mean, it's basically just the two owners, friends, people they know who make clothes and they open it up to other people to come and partake in that. It's all mostly handmade clothes. Um, there's a lot of other, I feel like there's a movement right now of, of people getting excited about makers and like Kathleen in Los Angeles is yeah. great. It's like a similar thing. It's all handmade clothes by and you can shop online. Yeah, all of these are online. It's like we all have so much access, so much more access to people, individuals making stuff. Yeah, yeah there's I a feel sh like Sorry. Oh, I just wanted to plug my local shop, Sassafras. They feature only um, Pacific Northwest makers. So they carry our work and my solo work and a bunch of Seattle designers up to Vancouver and down to Portland too. And they're kind of cool because um, I feel like as opposed to Kathleen and Cafe Forgot, which can be a little a little more youth focused, like they have some wild stuff. Um, Sassafras offers a lot of handmade garments that um, 
sort of cater to a more mature audience. They're like, they're, I hate to say it, but like more real clothing. <laughs> sure. <laughs> or, yeah. Yeah. Like more traditional. Wearability. Clothing. Yeah. yeah. They've got, they are, they are like on point with wearability. And, and I think that's great because all, all people need access to sustainably made clothing. Like no one should feel stuck in a world where they, they have to support slavery. Like that's not the world we should be living in. And when you say slavery, what do you mean by that? I mean, um, like mass manufactured clothing, like how I could go off for a really just long to time. Start, <laughs> no, totally. Just to start at a basic place for like someone who thinks they don't care about fashion and haven't, you know, hasn't thought about this. I mean, just think about the fact that nowhere in the world is there a machine that can automatically sew a t-shirt. Every t-shirt that exists in the world has been touched by human hands. Maybe it was cut with a die cut and that was fully automated, but a human has to run a sewing machine. So if you go to a store and you buy a newly manufactured t-shirt for $5, you have to consider the supply chain in that. It starts with the growing of the cotton, to the processing, to the production of the fabric, to the cutting of the fabric, and in between that you've got the actual design of the garment that's being manufactured. So that's a whole different, realm of labor from the designer themselves to the technical designer to the fit models, etc. So then from production in a factory, it's being sold at retail and there's people associated in that supply chain getting the material here, getting it onto the floor, selling it to you. And if it's only showing up on the floor for $5, then out of all of that, how much is the garment worker actually receiving? Like literally a penny. They're getting a penny for every t-shirt that they sew. And it's a highly skilled job. Like. No one can just show up day one and sew a t-shirt perfectly. You need to invest years. And t-shirts, you know, they're a simple garment, but they're not simple to make. Like somebody go out there and try to make a t-shirt from scratch, you're not going to do it well. And you're not going to do it to a quality that people actually want to purchase from a quality, quote unquote, quality store like H&M. Sorry, I keep throwing you under the bus, but I have a huge <laughs> problem with this because people don't understand the value of labor behind clothing. Like everything you own had to be made. So why should the person who actually made it only receive a penny for their labor? It's like sometimes I feel like I have to discount myself because people don't understand that it'll take me like six hours to make a garment and my labor isn't worth six cents, right? It's like, I've got to eat, I got to live in this city and so do these workers internationally. So yeah, it just, if it's, if it's $5 at a store brand new, it actually should cost $125 considering the labor involved in it and the natural resources. Because it takes a lot of energy to go from a raw fiber to a finished garment. And there's so many documentaries you can watch on this, The True Cost. There's so many books you can read about it. There's so much information and education you can receive on this matter. It shocks me that people continue to indulge in this level of convenience. And, and I think you become complicit in it. Like, you're complicit in slavery. And that's terrible. It's terrible for you and it's terrible for the person who's in debt bondage in Bangladesh sewing t-shirts in a factory that's gonna collapse in three months. Like, that happened too. Sorry, I could continue, but I'll stop. No, thank you. I mean, and we've already seen huge fallout in this supply chain because of COVID and because people aren't shopping as much. I'm just curious to know what you, uh, I don't know, what you, th what you make of what's happening right now and what changes uh, it could bring about. This is going to sound uh, really insensitive, but um, I feel like it might open up some opportunities for people who have um, a more local practice and um, make make things here um, who aren't reliant on supply chains internationally, um, which is exciting for sustainability, but um, but it's it's hard for the economy, I guess, and for the I don't know. Like I'm hoping that the harmful structures get 
broken a little bit and there's room for new things to grow. Yeah, I, I think everyone's becoming more intentional about supporting people, being intentional about connecting with other people and learning how they can support them. And it's through a lot of different ways. It's like calling a friend who you know lives alone and maybe has suffered with depression in the past and you care about them and you just want them to know like, I'm still here, you're still here, and I hope you're doing well. Um, I think the same is true with the fashion industry. It's like so many of us are out here trying to do a new thing and everybody's just scrolling Instagram because they're bored, like discovering all these these new resources. I, I totally agree with Camilla. I feel like it's a really powerful moment for individuals to make the choice that they're going to redirect where they're investing their money away from something that's harmful, both to labor and the environment and towards something that's, um, that's what's the opposite of harmful, <laughs> beneficial towards something that's beneficial for the local community. Um, makers like us, shops like Kathleen and Saf Sassafras, um, but also beneficial emotionally. It's like looking towards clothing to be something that you connect with and feel empowered by and not just a thing you put on your body. Though I know earlier I said that's, all, that's what I do. Um, <laughs> but there's still, there's still a lot of emotional content in the things that I wear from day to day. And I just, I just hope people come to a place where, yeah, they're thinking more about how they're spending their money and what they're truly investing in. And they're, they're turning themselves towards, towards things that they can feel more confident about and maybe less conflicted by. And we're seeing a lot of people sewing, which is really cool. Even just like sewing masks is such a powerful uh, reclamation or wait, rather than waiting for someone to give you. It's also about the power of cloth, right? You know, these textiles can literally save lives. These are tools, and rather than waiting for someone to hand you one, people are taking it in their own hands to make it, even without sewing it. And I just think that is so exciting. Just the little movement of making masks could have huge ripple effects. Or I hope totally. So. Yeah. yeah. Once you stop seeing I mean, that T-shirt as a T-shirt and as as uh, components that go together, and don't assign that symbol to it of being and I mean a t-shirt is such a huge it holds so much like uh, symbolism so once you let go of that and just accept that it's cloth and you have the power to make it I I think with that I know like four of my friends are learning how to sew right now like that is so cool yeah that's so cool do you yeah. have any advice for people who are you know, wading into sewing for the first time? Pick a material that's not that hard to work with, like a, a cotton, like the, what, the materials that are good to make masks out of are also really easy to sew, luckily. So yeah, and don't be too invested in the outcome of what it looks like at the end. Just roll yeah. with it. My mom taught me how to sew when I was a kid and she would just put me at the machine with a piece of paper so I could hit the gas and kind of draw on the paper and learn how to work between the fabric and the machine. And I, I think that's a skill that definitely comes with practice, but um, it's one that you can explore without having to waste fabric or create a big project just to learn some sewing techniques. It's like learn how to do a curve, learn how to get a, a really straight line with your machine, just like find ways that you can get to know your machine because that can be half the battle is just operating the machine itself. Totally. I hate using other people's sewing machines. Really? Yeah. Everything's wrong. It's like the tension's off. You keep breaking the needles. The power's not enough. Oh, I had no idea. That's so interesting. It's uh, it's like having your horse or something. Yeah. It's like your your <laughs> totally your tools of the trade. Yeah. Um, while while I'm shaking you both down for advice, um, there's another great question that's also very topical, which is, um, do you have any tips for sustaining friendship 
slash connection from a distance. Oh. Oh. Do we? (laughs) Just do what we did. Come on. Obvious. Just start a lifelong art practice. Um, actually, I do. Camilla one time sent me a game that they created called Stuck, and it was set up like memory, where you have a bunch of cards that you put upside down, and the idea was um, you lay out all these cards, and if you're creatively stuck, you just flip one over, and then whatever it says, you go with that, and so sometimes it was like, you know, paint it all white or I can't remember what they were but you like I think, made your own oblique strategy is kind of yeah but that's that so I, cool that idea of like um creating ways to play from afar um I think is something that could be really fun to explore and I mean exchanging art it doesn't have to be physical we've done different projects where it was um we just emailed photoshop files back and forth and would mess with the layers and add things on and create digital collages together. So that can be a really fun way to communicate with your friends because you can pull all kinds of resources into that. And it's it's more easily accessible um, since it's digital. Yeah, also dressing games are really fun. You know, we like have this what? up. We could wear the same color and zoom together or like dress on a theme or dress really ugly like Janelle's uh, like ugly house on the prairie collection like you know just explore dressing themes together I think it's really fun my friend Skyjar and I did that in high school um and that's actually where part of the ugly idea came from because we had ugly week and so we tried to put together the ugliest outfits possible and I kid you not I got more compliments that week than I did all year people loved our outfits and I I learned in that moment that I didn't actually know what good style was I couldn't (laughs) I couldn't parse out if it was that my I actually had bad taste and everyone else had good taste or everyone else had bad taste and I had truly good taste. So that was very informative. But we also did a week where we dressed as spies and like passed a briefcase between one another in the hallway. So there's so many fun things you can do with your friends, especially from afar. Um, but yeah, playing, I, I just think playing games, like staying, staying soft, it's hard, but it can be a lot easier to do it with a friend than when you're alone. Oh yeah. Um, thank you so much I feel like that's a perfect place to end and uh, thank you um, Janelle and Camilla and thank you to everyone who watched and listened I feel like we were all in a collaborative practice dressing practice together Um, yeah thank you thank you for tuning in and thanks to City Arts and Lectures for having us thank Thank you City Arts and Lectures thank you thank you thank you Avery thank you Avery thank you Janelle thanks Camilla thank you such a fangirl like Avery well cause you're y'all y'all have dressed me so I'm wearing female pants right now (laughs) so it is like a true exchange of like Words and words and concepts. I'm obsessed with these. Talk about wearability. I wasn't sure that they would actually be as comfortable as they are. They're super comfortable. They look so good. Yeah, they really do. Like they Thank were made you. for you. We just didn't know it. <laughs>